Coming Back is a listener-supported podcast. If you like the show and want to see it reach more grieving ears and hearts, support Coming Back on Patreon at patreon.com slash Shelby Forsythia. My Patreon supporters get exclusive access to weekly grief journaling prompts and live grief hangouts with me. Pledge for as little as $1 per month and change or cancel your support at any time. Join this growing behind-the-scenes community now at patreon.com slash Shelby for Scythia. Thank you so much for listening to Coming Back. Just one more thing, grief growers. Do you ever feel trapped, stuck, or silenced in the aftermath of loss? Are you struggling to figure out who you are now or what your life is made of now that death, divorce, or diagnosis has steamrolled through? Whether you're trying to cultivate deeper self-compassion, figure out where grief belongs in your life now, or simply feel like you have more room to breathe, the three words that your heart needs to hear are permission to grieve. Permission to grieve is the title of my latest book, a tribute to the three little words that changed how I saw myself and my grief after the death of my mom. I know it has the power to change how you see yourself and your grief in whatever loss you're facing. You can find Permission to Grieve now on Amazon. Give yourself more grace, space, and room to breathe in the aftermath of loss, because we could all use a little more Permission to Grieve. Hi there, and welcome to Coming Back, a podcast about coming back to life after death, divorce, diagnosis, and more. On today's show, I'm speaking to Hope Edelman, a coach and the author of five incredible books on grief, including Motherless Daughters, Motherless Mothers, and Letters from Motherless Daughters. Also this week, I'm reminding you that permission to grieve is a practice, and sharing yet another excerpt from my new book, Permission to Grieve. I'm Shelby Forsythia an intuitive grief guide and author who speaks, writes, and teaches powerful truths on grief and loss. My mom's death in 2013 set me on the path to becoming a lifelong student of grief, and I use what I learned to help others find direction, get support, and cultivate radical self-compassion in the aftermath of loss. Because even through grief, we are growing. Let's get started. Hi there, and welcome to yet another episode of Coming Back. Thank you so very much for listening today. Really quick, Grief Growers, if you'd like grief support beyond this podcast, my next live grief support session is happening Monday, October 28th at 8 p.m. Central Time. I am at your disposal, sharing all of my favorite grief resources and stories, and it's a wonderful space for you to share your own loss story and meet other people who also listen to this podcast. To join the grief support session, all you need to do is pledge any amount at patreon.com slash Shelby for Scythia. When you pledge, you'll instantly unlock the link to all of my private posts, including the link to join us live on October 28th. You can also watch replays of previous grief support sessions and see the comments that other Patreon supporters have left on each video, which is pretty cool. You can find that link to pledge and join us at patreon.com slash Shelby for Scythia in the show notes. So this week is a quick one, grief growers. I'll keep the top of the show more or less brief because my interview with Hope Edelman is so good and so gloriously long. But this week, I wanted to share with you the notion that permission to grieve is a practice. Now, for some of you who've already read my book or have been practicing your own form of permission to grieve for years in your own way, this will be a big, oh, duh, of course, A few of us know that permission to grieve is something we need to give ourselves over and over and over again. But for most grievers, many of which helped me write permission to grieve, permission to grieve does not feel like a practice or something that comes as second nature. Check out this chapter from permission to grieve called permission requires practice. Permission requires practice. We were all beginners once. As I did research for this book, I was surprised to discover just how many people didn't think they could give themselves permission to grieve. Whether they didn't think they had the authority to do so, or they had just never realized it was an option, 
it amazed me to read and hear that permission granting wasn't an easy or obvious process. But then I put myself back into those freshly grieving shoes and remembered that I was once a first-timer at permission granting, too. It's like when my friends asked me to teach them how to play the piano when we were all in high school. I'd been playing consistently since the age of five, and it amazed me that they didn't quickly pick up hand positioning, finger numbering, and sight reading each week. By that point, I was fluent in the language of music. I spoke it with speed and ease. I was baffled when my friends couldn't bang out tunes just like I could. But then I took myself back into a beginner's mind, when I used to plunk out scales and write numbers on each of my fingers. When I was first learning to play the piano, I used masking tape to label the notes of my clunky upright grand piano's aged keys. And then I sat for hours every week at that old wooden instrument driving my family nuts by playing the same song over and over again until I got it right. I practiced Mary Had a Little Lamb for weeks and eventually moved to Canon and D after years of practice. Then I dropped my formal lessons to join my high school's traveling jazz band where I improvised on the spot and interpreted chord charts to create one-of-a-kind pieces. Playing the piano started out as a very clunky, slow-going practice, but years, literally a decade, of practice secured it as a second language in my mind. Now when I sit down at the piano, the language of music and my muscle memory show up with very little to no effort on my part. Playing the piano feels like second nature but it wasn't always. Permission to grieve is like that. It feels really foreign at first, almost novel. It's so out of the ordinary that it doesn't occur to people that they have the power to grant this kind of permission to themselves. Pause button. What skill, movement, or practice is second nature to you? This could be anything from playing an instrument or speaking a language to driving to work or folding towels in a special way. What have you learned with time that seems almost automatic? The first time I granted myself permission to grieve, breaking down on the floor of my apartment and essentially throwing an adult temper tantrum, I laughed and shrieked with the wild freedom of it. It was amazing and hilarious to me that I kept myself cooped up for so long when all I really wanted and needed was to move my body and cry it out. Permission to move my body, permission to cry no matter who's watching, and permission to appear crazy were my first introductions to permission to grieve. Simple, basic, vital. Mary had a little lamb, if you will. In the years that followed, I found that I needed to build on my established permissions. Permission to talk about my mom at work joined the list. Permission to change my mind fell into the ranks. Permission to ask for help from others was a hard but important addition, especially when I fell very ill after my mom died. With the writing of this book, I'm granting myself permission to leave to-do lists unfinished, something I've struggled to do since I was little. I'm also granting myself permission to welcome a new woman into my father's life as his wife. And perpetually, it seems, I'm giving myself permission to miss my mom on the train to work, while I'm podcasting and writing, and whenever the longing strikes me, no place or circumstance is too weird a time to miss my mom, I'm finding. The bathroom, the park, the Chicago River Walk. I have permission to miss you. I miss you. I miss you. And that's okay. I share this with you to tell you, remind you, and encourage you to believe that you have the power to grant yourself permission to grieve. Nobody, not even me, needs to give it to you. You already have it. It will probably feel bizarre and awkward at first, moving from a space of the world says grief looks like this to my grief looks like this. It's jarring to adopt a new story after having operated by an old one for so long. But with time and practice, granting yourself permission to feel, be, and do the experience of grief will come easily. You'll pinpoint and notice stuck or trapped grief quickly. You'll develop vocabulary and compassion for the parts of you that have been isolated and abandoned. And you'll move into a constant awareness of your permission to grieve radar, always asking yourself, where am I stuck? How do I wish things were different? What do I really need right now? How can I give myself more permission to grieve? If you're practicing permission to grieve, but want some more support or tools to help you do so, check out my new book, Permission to Grieve, which is live now on Amazon. If you're not practicing permission to grieve, but really want to learn how, you can also check out my new book, Permission to Grieve, live on Amazon.
Permission to Grieve is both a teacher for first timers and a reminder for old timers, joking, not saying anything about your age, that creating grace, space, and room to breathe in the aftermath of loss is something we must do over and over and over again. And with practice, it becomes a practice. And if you read the book, be sure to let me know what you think through an Amazon review, a review on Goodreads, or an email, shelby at shelbyforsythia.com. I am always so delighted to hear what you think of my heart's work, grief growers. And thank you all so much for helping me write this important, important book. You can find a link to Permission to Grieve in the show notes. Up next, my chat with Hope Edelman, author of Motherless Daughters, Motherless Mothers, and so much more. Grief is setting sail, twice, on the 2020 Bereavement Cruises. To join a boatload of grieving hearts for interactive grief workshops, heart healing craft projects, circles of hope, and a beautiful candlelit night of remembrance at sea, request more information at comingbackcruise.com. You'll be contacted by the cruise's organizer and previous Coming Back podcast guest, Linda Finley, to hear more about your choice of two tropical cruises setting sail in 2020. And when you're ready, she'll help you reserve your spot on board. Bereavement cruise cabins do go quickly, so request more information now at comingbackcruise.com, where grief finds support and community on the open sea. Hope Edelman is a coach and best-selling author of Motherless Daughters, Motherless Mothers, and five other books. She is currently working on a new book called The After Grief that explores what we refer to in this interview as the long arc of grief. Hope lives in LA with her husband and two daughters. Grief growers, I am so wonderfully thrilled to introduce you to Hope Edelman because I read her book, Motherless Daughters. It was probably one of the first 10 books that I ever read about grief after the death of my mother. And it was so big and so comprehensive and so relatable instantly that I knew one day I had to have the author on coming back to speak with all of you, especially because I know that so many of you listening have lost your mothers as well. So Hope, welcome to the show. And we'll start where we start all of our interviews with your lost story. Sure. Thank you, Shelby, so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Well, I was 17 years old when my mom died, but I need to back up about a year and a half to her diagnosis with breast cancer when I was 15. Um, she was diagnosed quite late. Uh, kids in the family didn't know it. I was the oldest of three. I mean, we knew she had cancer, of course, and we knew she had surgery, but we thought she was getting better for 16 months until at the very end, we were told that she was going into the hospital and was unlikely to return. So that was a bit of a shock, to say the least. So even though our mom had been terminally ill for 16 months, we experienced it as a sudden loss because we didn't have very much time to get used to the idea that she was going to die. And um, that was the summer in between my junior and senior year of high school. And I was the oldest child of three. So that was a tough year, the year that followed. It was 1981, which were kind of the dark ages in grief support, as were the 70s and the 60s and the 50s. And uh, things got better in the 90s, but in the 1980s, there still wasn't anything available for a family that was grieving the loss of one of its members. So our coping strategy was just to soldier on and not talk about how we were feeling and hardly talk about my mom at all. And I went to college a year later and did my very best to forget what had happened, to visit home as little as possible to avoid conversations about my mom. And I was able to sustain that for about seven years until it really came crashing down on me. And I was engaged and had made the choice to end the engagement for various reasons. And that loss brought that earlier, larger loss right up to the surface. And I was very fortunate at that time to be able to work with a very good therapist to help me process the loss that had never been addressed, that grief that had been really mismanaged or un un unattended to. And uh, so that, that puts me in my mid-20s. And then I 
went to graduate school for creative writing and started writing motherless daughters while I was there because there wasn't any book on the subject and I thought there needed to be, and I was tired of waiting for one. So I thought, well, heck, I guess I'll just, I'll start interviewing women and write it myself. And the first edition came out in 1994. And here we are now, 25 years later, it's the 25th anniversary of that book. And it's still been in print. It's in, it's, uh, in 15 countries right now. And it, it's going to come out in China and Russia within the next year, too. So that'll be 17. Well, I'm so thrilled. And congratulations on the 25th anniversary of Motherless Daughters. I mean, who knew that it would be so big and so great? But also, of course, it would be so big and so great because it fills this very intense and massive need for conversations from about written by motherless daughters. And I think that was my favorite part of the book is reading all of these experiences from others because you, I mean, one of the biggest reasons I started this podcast is that you get a bit when you hear somebody else's story, but when you can get a catalog of people's stories, not only does it turn loss into a universal and holistic experience that everybody goes through, but then you also get all of these individual voices and circumstances that you can start to align yourself with and identify with. And that's really powerful. I think uh, the first thing that I want to go back to for you um, is this notion of, we thought she was getting better and then she was going to the hospital and she'd probably never return in this notion of sudden death. And I wonder, was there some kind of, was it secrecy on purpose or there was there some kind of uncontrollable surprise that happened? Uh, it was secrecy on purpose. Mm -hmm. It was 1981, and it was still of the era when doctors would give a woman's medical um, diagnoses and um, her test results to her husband and let him decide what and how to tell her. And so. Um, when my mother got very, very sick at the end, very quickly, just in a, she really declined in a period of about a week and a half. And um, while we were waiting for the ambulance to come, my father sat me down and told me that she, that's when he said, you know, she's going to the hospital and she's not going to come back. Those were the exact words that he used. And I remember thinking, what, what are you talking about? Like, then where's she going to go, right? <laughs> like, where's she going to go if not here? She's going to go like live with her mom or something? And it was just so incomprehensible to me. And he, I said, but what about all those scans she was having? Cause she would get cat scans or pet scans and, you know, full body scans and come home and tell us that the results were normal. And he said, no, they were never normal. I've known all along. And so I had to process, well, my mom's going to die and my dad's known it and he hasn't told us and he hasn't told her. And you know, it was just way too much to process. And then the ambulance came and brought her to the hospital. And then we, you know, sort of got on the fast forward express to, you know, her funeral, essentially. And it took me a really a long time to sort through that. And then it took me even longer to let go of that anger toward my dad, who I ultimately came to understand was really doing what he thought was best and had to carry that terrible secret by himself for 16 months, you know? And that must have been so hard. I can't imagine carrying that burden by myself. But I was not mature enough, and I did not have the experience or the wisdom to even understand that at 17. I was just a big ball of white hot rage that my mom hadn't known she was dying and the kids hadn't known. And we didn't really get to say goodbye. It just felt so unfair. And it still does. I don't have the anger around it now. I think it's more sadness. But it was it was deliberate silence. and it's really debatable how much she knew now, because I think, how could your body be failing you that much and not know that you weren't getting better? I mean, she was on chemotherapy straight for 16 months and the, the doctor just kept changing the protocol, you know, trying to find something that would help or extend her life. And, you know, now, of course, I know that's not a good sign, but at 17, I mean, it was my first encounter with it. I just, I thought that was normal. I know this is a question that goes far bigger than you and the work of motherless daughters, but I wonder why or why you think people think that they still need to keep death and the process of dying such a big secret, because I don't think this is, I think it's gotten better, but we're not, we're not having these conversations every day either. 
No, that's a really good question. You know, there's a film out now called The Farewell. Have you heard of it? It's a Chinese film. I have, and I haven't seen it yet. And I'm so, so like no. waiting to just sit down and watch it because I believe the plot, if I'm not mistaken, is there's an, an elderly woman dying and she doesn't want to talk about the fact that she knows she's dying and her family thinks she doesn't know, and but they won't tell her because they're afraid to tell her. Uh-huh. I think there's also a real cultural element to it. I, I from what I understand from watching oh, yeah. and reading about it, in Ch- Chinese culture, you would not tell someone that they were that sick out of fear that they would give up and then die. So they thought by not telling her, they might be keeping her alive longer. And so the family, I believe, goes from America maybe to China. I, I I'm probably getting this all wrong, so I'm going to stop because I haven't seen it yet. But it looks fascinating to me because um, I think that might have been part of what was going on in my family. You know, this idea that maybe if my mom knew how sick she was, she would give up. And um, I had a conversation with her best friend many years later, who basically said as much to me. She said, first of all, don't discount the possibility that your parents had been married for 21 years, and they may have had an unspoken agreement between them that your dad would always get the bad news and then decide you know, what to tell her. And she was okay with that. She said, well, what kind of relationship your parents had? And that might have been, you know, an unspoken agreement between them that your mom was actually part of. She said, the other thing is she said, I've known your, I I knew your mom since she was 13 years old. I don't think she was strong enough to handle that news. She said, I think you would have lost her sooner. She said, I think you may have gotten a couple more months with her because she didn't know. And that was kind of eye opening because I hadn't considered that possibility. And then I realized, oh, this is so much more layered and complex than my 17-year-old mind could handle at that time, which was just, you know, um, men are bad and and the woman was the victim and I'm going to be on my mom's side and, you know, fight for justice. And and that was energizing for a while, I suppose. I mean, it did make me very, very, um, very, a very strong advocate for my own health. Um, I get my checkups very regularly. I always I, I want the doctors to be straight up with me. You know, I don't ask for hand holding or sugar coating if if there's bad news. Fortunately, there's never been terrible news for me, but there has been for others. And I've just wanted to get it. You know, I feel like I can handle anything as long as I know it's the truth. What I really don't think I can handle is to have facts hidden, you know, or or have things unspoken. Um, and that's I believe residual a residual effect of having discovered in such a surprising and, and uh, shocking and conflated manner that my mom had been dying for 16 months and wasn't going to make it more than a few more days. I'm going to validate that as well, because I think something that happens in the aftermath of loss is all of a sudden we're craving clarity. We're like, if if that was true, give me everything else that's going to be true because I can't take any more <laughs> hidden crap. You know, there's this... Um, there's this longing or even like a restless angst that comes up of like, tell me everything that's true. Give it to me straight up. I can totally take it. And also too, if I can take this person's death, then I can handle anything else that's true. I think also, I mean, my God, someone dying is so real, right? It's like, then I just wanted to like traffic in the real for a while. It's probably not a surprise that I became a nonfiction writer. Because I just wanted to, you know, I wanted, I had such a hunger for the facts and the truth and, you know, the verifiable um, details of an event. And, you know, I loved researching and fact checking. Fact checking is usually the part of journalism people like least. I think it was the part I liked best, you know, just making sure that everything was accurate and true, you know, and, and verifiable to the extent that it could be. And, um, you know, I think I just had such a hunger for things that were real after that, you know, like I didn't want to be, uh, I didn't want to stay at the surface anymore. I didn't want to be gaslit or, you know, even like I said, handheld. I just, I, I just had this like real sense of wanting to be there in the grit of real life and not be afraid of it. In fact, welcome it and honor it. You know, I lead retreats now for women whose moms have died and really frequently. In fact, just the other day, someone said to me, how do you do that? It must be so sad. Like, how do you sit in a room with all these women crying? And I say, well, a couple things. First of all, it's not like I sit in a room for four days with 26 women who can't stop crying. I mean, yeah, there's tears, but there's a lot of laughter at these retreats because these women share a certain kind of humor and they get each other, you know, and it's, it's really funny at times over the weekend. It's not funny that their mom's side, of course, but the way they tell their stories sometimes, you know, someone will stumble into a saying or a certain 
you know, a certain uh, turn of phrase and everyone will laugh because they understand where it's coming from. And, you know, they'll laugh in recognition and relief, not even always out of humor. But I say, oh, I'm not afraid of it, though. It, it, it's not a burden to me. It's like I, I love doing this work. I look forward to it because for four days, these women are open and vulnerable and honest, and they're talking about real stuff, and they're connecting at this very human, very deep level that I think we have less and less of these days, you know, now that we're, we're plugged in all the time. But they turn their phones off or leave them in their rooms, and they come and sit in the circle face-to-face and have real conversation. And I think that's beautiful. So uh, it's not hard for me at all. I mean, it's emotional, but it's not overbearing. It's not, you know, exhausting. It's, um, it's actually really, really beautiful to witness. Well, because that's where the truth lives. Yeah. is in those spaces where where clarity and honesty are. It's like, I don't have to do the exhaustion of trying to keep up with something that isn't true or carry something that's too heavy for me. It's like, I just get to be where the truth is. And when it doesn't, I'm getting an image of like a cork in your throat when it's not stoppered by something. It's mm-hmm. You can relax into things that are hard because everything's out in the open. And I'm just contributing that um, from my own experience as well, because that's also how I prefer to live. I want to circle back to this conversation that you had with your mom's best friend, because it reminded me of conversations that I've had with my mom's friends and her sisters and things like that after her death. And one of the quotes that I highlighted the first time I read Motherless Daughters is, when a mother dies, she takes her stories with her. And there's this notion of all of a sudden, or gradually having to piece together the people that our moms were, and then in addition, having these new discoveries and new insights over time. So I wonder if you can talk about maybe one or two of the stories that have come forward for you that you never expected to learn about your mom or other ones that caused like this light bulb to turn on for you, added another facet to her. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a big one. And that one um, from her best friend, I think, you know, my mom took stories with her, What she took were her interpretation of events, right? Like I can find people who were there and shared experiences with her. But when I asked them, to share those stories, what I get is their take. And I think one of the greatest gifts I ever received was when I was writing Motherless Daughters, I was, I think, on my way from Washington, D.C. back to New York, which is where I lived when I wrote the book. And I went through Philadelphia, and I stayed overnight with another very good friend of my mother's. There were two women who um, had lived in the same apartment building as us when I was born. One was my mother's childhood friend who I just mentioned, and another was someone that she'd met in the building. And she stayed very close with these two women, even after they all moved into houses, different cities, different states, even. And um, I saw them and their children, you know, a lot when I was growing up. So I stopped in Charlotte's house in Philadelphia on the way back to New York, spent the night. And um, she knew I was working on this book. And she took a box of tissues and she came and sat on the bed with me and put the box of tissues in the middle and said, ask me anything you want to know about your mom. Anything that I know, I'll share with you. She said, I bet you have questions. They're probably stories you don't know. And we sat and she knew from my mom the story of her wedding night. And she knew, uh, she remembered stories from my very early childhood that I wouldn't remember because I was too young, but she was there and had witnessed. You know, She remembered my first birthday party. And it was a terrific gift because my father, you know, clearly was there for some events, but he was really not that useful when I asked him stories about childhood, especially when I became a <laughs> mother. You know, he he had gone, you know, for whatever reason, he completely revised history. And according to my dad, we were the most wonderful children who had ever walked on the earth and never did anything wrong, which Ooh. is not <laughs> I know that's not true. I remember. The trouble I was there. there. I, I do remember that. And so it was very sweet to hear him recount things in this way, but it was completely revisionist history. So I, I, could, and, um, I could get stories from her friends and, you know, whatever my younger siblings remembered as well. But I really craved that when I became a mom. Um, I was 32 when I got pregnant. So that was 14 years after my mom had died. And I didn't know anything hardly about her pregnancy. I didn't know anything at all about her labor, which um, was a a twilight sleep in the 1960s. So I'm not sure it would have been that helpful to know it anyway. But I was really interested in knowing what I'd been like as an infant and how she had, you know, managed 
And I didn't have access to any of that. What I did have were she kept very detailed baby books for all three children. And somehow I was in possession. I don't even know how, honestly, but somehow I was in possession of the baby book that my grandmother kept for my mother from 1938. So I had those two generations of details to compare to my daughter when I started bringing her to the pediatrician, you know, to get measured, to get weighed, et cetera, it took her first steps. Um, so I could pie I pieced together things as best as I could from those original documents and from stories from people around me. And it wasn't nearly as good as having them from my mom, but it was better than not having anything at all. And um, so I was, I was grateful for that. And it inspired me to keep pretty detailed baby books for my daughters as well. I hope, of course, that I'll be here if, when and if they have children of their own. But even if I am, I think it's great to have that record because I can't hold all that in my head. I just want to speak to this idea of something happens, I think, with, with all people who have lost, where we become people that just make do with what we have left. Mm -hmm. And there's, there can be a bitterness in that. But there can also be like a scrappiness or um, like a resilience in that too. Sometimes I'm really proud of that. Like, look at me making do. I'm still here. And other days I'm like, man, I wish I had a lot more to work with. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, I call that two truths, holding two truths side by side. On the one hand, you can celebrate your scrappiness and your resilience and your resourcefulness, right? Um, I think, wow, I'm so adaptable because I've had to just adapt and readapt so many times in my life. And I like that about myself. I do. On the other hand, I really wish I didn't have to be all of those things or hadn't had to learn them the way that I did. Right. And both of those things can be true. I can be grateful for those qualities and I can wish that I'd never had to develop them. And you, it, it seems like they'd be contradictory or cancel each other out, but they're not, they're both equivalently true in my life. And I'm a coach also, and I coach women who've lost moms or anyone who's had an early loss that's still resonating decades later, as it does. And we talk about that. You know, we talk about, okay, you know, I can, I can tell myself my surviving parent did the very best that they could with the limited tools that they had, and I can feel compassion for them. And I can hold that truth side by side with they were the parent and I was the kid and I needed something that they didn't give me and I didn't get it. And I'm pissed about that. You know, it's okay to be angry about that. It's not the same thing as being angry as that at that parent today, necessarily. Sometimes it is, but not always. And um, I think we have to learn how to hold those two truths side by side. You know, life is not binary. Um, binary thinking is the easiest and most reductive way to get through our lives. But I think it's the least interesting, to be honest. I think most experiences and circumstances that we're in are much more layered and, and complex than a simple, you know, yes or no, A or B, black or white. And so it's, I think it's in that complexity that we find the richness. And then we find, you know, like, like you were saying, some of those things that we really can celebrate in addition to whatever brings us pain. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. I know in my own work, in my own way, I call it grief guidance. I call it the divine dichotomy. You hold one truth in each hand and you can't let either of them drop because they're both true. Mm -hmm. uh, and you kind of just carry them around forever. And in my mind, it's a sign of maturity or even evolution in grief, because to think that we can only hold one thing at a time is like an immature thought. Um in my mind, and then to be able to hold multiple or even to hold these oceans and oceans of emotions and grief as you do is, is just proof that we can become bigger and better containers for our grief as it matures alongside us. Right, exactly. And it is going to mature and change, you know, we're going to have new insights. And sometimes those are going to bring us great joy and peace. And sometimes those insights are going to be really destabilizing and bring us a lot of, you know, pad sadness and the feeling that we're regrieving. And, you know, because we are reprocessing now from, you know, the, those same facts from a new point of view and interpreting them differently and integrating that new point of view into our identity today as we, you know, as we move forward. Um, did you see the, um, interview that Anderson Cooper did with Stephen Colbert a couple of weeks ago. I did. It made me cry because <laughs> I love the two of them so very much. And I had no idea that this was a part of their history. 
I knew it about Colbert. I had no idea that Anderson Cooper was 10 when his dad died. And okay. So yeah, I had vice versa. I was really? like, I, I knew about Anderson Cooper. I didn't know about Stephen Colbert. And so when I, I watched it, I was like, oh my God. And he has a tragic story, right? It was his dad and two of his brothers all died in airplane, commercial air, airplane crash together. But he talks about, you know, learning to love the thing you most wish had not happened. And I thought, oh, it's such a beautiful way to to express this, you know, it's not putting a positive spin on loss because no one's, I'm not, I tell my clients, nobody's trying to take away your pain or the fact that this was really hard and tragic and sad and still is. No one's taking that away. But what we're saying is that there are multiple ways to look at it. There are many alternative storylines that are equally true. And let's, you know, let's um, tease out and, and, you know, really engage and activate some of those. Because that's another form of resilience is to, you know, not just walk around with the sad story defining you, but to find the others that define you at the same time without letting go of that original one. You know, it's when people's identity is wrapped up in um, this sadness or this tragedy or this belief that everything's in their life today is difficult because this terrible thing happened to them when they were younger, that it's much harder to find happiness, right? Because you can't do much with that. If you're, if you're making that direct equation between, you know, my mom or my dad died when I was 12 and now I'm 35 and, you know, I, everything's been really hard for me, then everything's going to keep being hard for you because your dad's always going to be dead, right? But when we pe- tease apart that story and I say, okay, yeah, okay, your dad died when you were 12 and that's, that's a really hard thing. And yes, it did lead to some adverse events. Let's look at what they were, you know, because it's usually it's, well, the dad died and then something else happened and then something else happened and then something should have happened and didn't. And then something else happened. And then, you know, and, and so there's many steps along the way to get to where they are today. And we can look back and say, well, you know, any of those intervening variables, can we work on those today? Can we change some of those now to create a different outcome for you in the future? And then there's movement, right? Because we're letting air into that story because my dad died when I was 12 and my life is really hard today is a story without a middle, right? It's just a beginning and an end. When you open it up and look at the whole middle of that story, there's a lot more room to work in there. And that's the majority of what I do with my clients is, is really open up their stories and see places where we can really affect some change or change belief systems to create a different outcome for them moving forward. And, um, I think it's really powerful work because no one taught me how to do that. I had to learn how to do it myself and it took decades. So it's really a gift to be able to help people do it in even a first or second session, right? And save people a couple extra decades of work on their own. And then they can go forward and do other things in the future. I'm just totally geeking out about this idea of adding the middle or questioning where the middle of the story is, or even sometimes writing the middle, because where people can often really easily identify, here's the beginning, here's the end, what happens in between can be a blur or a blackout or a mixed up tangle of events. And we're like, I don't even know where to start writing the middle. And so to even say, start from here, or let's find out or walk through this spirally path Mm -hmm. together is really, really powerful. And I think that's where a lot of us land in grief. That's where most of the story lives. You know, I live in Los Angeles. A lot of my friends are screenwriters and screenwriters like to say that the the middle of the middle or the second act is the middle of a screenplay, right? They say the second act is where a story goes to die because that's where they go all tangled up in the, you know, the, the changing circumstances and developments and the overcoming of the obstacles, right? It's the, it's the, the largest part of a story, the second act you know, in, in Aristotelian structure, which is what a screenplay is based on usually. And so um, the middle is the hardest part to write. And I think if for some of us, you know, it's the hardest part to remember. It's oftentimes the hardest part to live through. Yes. Everything that comes after the death event, right? It's the topic of my next book, basically. The topic of my next book is everything that comes after someone dies and how far into the future it extends because bereavement services are really there just for the first year or two after someone dies. And if you're having a grief reaction 10 or 20 years later, which happens, and it's not abnormal, it happens for a number of different reasons. But if you're having a grief reaction 10 or 20 years later and you try to find support services, it's really hard to find um, because most um, 
institutions or most centers uh, will not have the funding or have it in their mission statement to help people 10 or 20 years down the road. They're there for the acute phase, just in the first couple of years. So my initiative is to call more attention to that, what I'm calling the long arc of grief, because my mom died 38 years ago, and it's not anywhere near as fresh anymore as it was for me at, you know, two years or five years or even seven years, but it still comes up. You know, it still comes up and there are very predictable points in someone's story where a grief resurgence is likely to occur. And there just isn't any kind of structured support for that um, out there, really anywhere that I'm aware of in this country. I mean, certain cultural groups, I think, do a better do a better job of giving their members a framework, at least for understanding how long the process is. But, um, you know, in the secular world, there's very little. There's the funeral, and then you go home, and maybe if you're lucky, you get three days off of work, and then you have to go back. And for the sake of the people around you, pretend that everything's okay. Yeah, and I'll echo that there in the sense that there's nothing that ritualizes or memorializes it that's societally set in place. And so oftentimes the burden is on the grievers to have an empty memorial chair at the wedding or name your child after your deceased person or kind of all these things that come with these big milestones where it would be lovely if there was some kind of prescribed norm of, and this is what we do when this milestone happens, and this is what we do when this milestone happens, but the there's a disproportionate burden of decision on what to do now that these huge milestones are rolling through 10, 20, 30 years later. Um, and that's so much of what we talk about on coming back is this, this notion of regrieving or grief being a long-term relationship as opposed to something that, that comes and then it goes away. Um, and I think um, something that you've kind of touched on too is this idea that the grief resources don't exist 10, 20, 30 years down the road, because that's something that, at least from what I've seen, that society still pathologizes. Like, oh, you're still there? Then there must be something wrong with you. Right. Haven't you gotten over it yet? Yeah. What gives? <laughs> right? You're not over it yet? Right? Like, I mean, yeah, exactly. Um, if I could remove one phrase from the English lexicon, it would be that. It would be, uh, haven't you gotten over it yet? Yeah. Because I don't think people asking that question really even have an idea of what that means or what they'd be asking for. Like, really, what would it look like to be over it? Would that mean, like, you know, that you never talk about the person who died? No way. I'm not going to stop doing that. You know, does it mean that you don't ever think about them? I mean, that sounds pathological to me, actually, to just wipe them from your memory so you don't get upset or upset the people around you. Um, I think that finding healthy ways to remember and incorporate our deceased loved ones into our lives is what we are meant to do because that's what humans did for millennia, basically until the 20th century, to be honest. I, I've been doing research on ancient and uh, romantic and Victorian mourning practices, and it's extraordinary, you know, how ritualized they were and how many rules there were. You know, in, in 19th century England, you would walk down the street and if you were up on things, because there was a thick book that most women kept in their houses so that they could refer to it when someone died, you would have a sense of who was in mourning and who wasn't because of the way that they were dressing, right? The men wore black armbands and the women had very elaborate rules for dress. Not only would you know who was in mourning, you would know how long ago the loss occurred because especially for women, the color of the clothing you were allowed to wear changed over time. And if you uh, knew the person, you would, of course, well, if you really knew them, you would know who died. But if you were just observing them, you would have a sense of who died eventually because of how long they were mourning, because there were rules that, let, that extended anywhere from six weeks to two years, depending on whether it was like, you know, your sister-in-law or your spouse. And there was an enormous industry around mourning products. And you'd also walk down the street, you'd know which houses had lost a loved one because there would be a specific kind of wreath hanging on the door to let people know. And we just lost all of that. We don't have any of that anymore. You know, um, we can't tell when somebody is mourning or grieving. There's no visible evidence. And like you said, the, the burden is on the mourner to explain why they might be looking downcast, right? or why they might not want to partake in social activities yet. Or it, it's definitely, 
up to the mourner to let other people know rather than having signals or signs that others would be able to interpret and know how to act because there were also social codes for how to treat the mourners and how they were to act in society as well. Fascinating, isn't it? That's incredible. And I I love looking at historical traditions of mourning as well. My favorite and one that I've shared on the show is the practice of keening, which is where people would uh, either hire, hire, bring in, or their own relatives would like wail and tear their hair out and make a lot of noise like vocally at funerals and memorial ceremonies to express a collective grief and allowing grief to have like that very carnal animalistic sound is one of my favorite things. Cause that's my first instinct when loss happens is to yell about it. And it's not polite society by any means. <laughs> yeah, the, the Celts knew that the Irish knew that I understand that um, in certain Hindu traditions, the women go to a room to mourn and all the women from you know the area the village the family come in that room with them and they hire somebody a professional you know woman to come in and do the wailing with them yeah so that they release it from their bodies um and if we look at a lot of indigenous tribes um or indigenous societies and and tribal customs you know there's quite a few that are really about allowing you to release it from your body as a form of mental hygiene and to do it in the community of people, you know, who can help you contain it. We don't do any of that, really. We do not. And really quickly, I want to circle back to what kind of kicked off that whole conversation, which was banishing this question of, haven't you gotten over it yet? And I think a really helpful tip for grief growers who are listening to this episode is to push back with Hope's question of, well, what would that look like to you? Because forcing people who are asking the question to define it on your behalf, I think jokingly and lovingly helps them see that there really is no prescribed picture of what that really looks like. And if they think there is, if they say something like, well, once you stop talking about it, or once you stop acting so sad, or blah, 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 that's a really good permission slip or even a red flag to cut that person out of your life. I, you know, I've also found that if someone says, aren't you over it yet? It's generally someone who hasn't had a major loss in their lives, right? Oh, yeah. Um, for the most part, those who have any EQ know not to ask that question. But, um, but you know, what I've found is that for me, and it's an individual, of course, but for me, the best answer has been, yeah, it doesn't really work like that. I wish it did, but that, that just isn't how it works. And I feel like then I'm educating them, right? So that when the time comes and they discovered, oh, that's not how it works, maybe they'll remember that someone, they don't have to remember it was me, but maybe they'll remember that someone told them, you know, it's okay if you haven't gotten over it 10 or 20 years later, that's just not how it works. I want to kind of get into specifics with you because your book is called Motherless Daughters and focuses on this relationship between mothers and daughters specifically. And I want to know what makes that relationship special and how is it different from other types of grief? Because I know because I've lived this, <laughs> um, but I think especially for friends and coworkers and things who don't quite know what it's like, um, I think you touch on so many things in the book, but I wonder if there's um, a couple of definite pinpoints you can look at and be like, this is how it's different from other losses. Well, you know, again, it depends on the family. In some, in most families, the mother is the more emotionally expressive parent who helps the children learn how to regulate their own emotions and tends to their distress. If she's the one who did that and then she's not there, then you really, you know, then you're in distress because she's not there and she's not there to help you with that distress, which is a, a really big conundrum, especially for small children. Um, but there are families where the father is the more nurturing parent. That certainly can happen. So that depends, you know, and, and not all mother daughter relationships are close. I happen to have a good mother and I was pretty close with her, but not everybody feels that their mom, you know, did the best job that she could. And some are very ambivalent about the relationships or had moms who were addicted or abusive or mentally ill. So um, there are many varieties of mother daughter relationships. What I can share with you is that I was speaking not long ago with um, a professor at Northwestern, Dan McAdams is his name. He specializes in um, self narratives, which is the study of how people construct their own life stories. And he said that, you know, he, he, he has collected people's narratives and asked them to tell their stories and study how they tell their stories for decades now. 
And he said that when women tell their stories, that the, 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 the hardest part for them to recollect and often the saddest part for them is talking about their mother's dying, that there's something so primal about that connection that it's um, a really tender part in a woman of a woman's story, especially, you know, if she had a close relationship with her and she misses her. Um, and I think there's also something so rich about if, if you have children, you know, about being the maternal line. And when your mom dies, oftentimes you're then the oldest woman in that line. And if your mom dies when you're relatively young and your grandma's not still around, you know, I, I, I think I was the oldest woman in my direct maternal line when I was 30, 29. I was really young to feel like, geez, I'm the matriarch of, you know, this line. I had a sister, of course. So, but I'm talking about, you know, just sort of like the direct maternal line. And now I have two daughters. Um, but at the time I didn't. And I, it was just kind of this strange feeling like I didn't have a ceiling or a floor, you know? Uh, and and I, I, I kind of felt untethered for a while. So I think maybe that's part of it. You know, I think it, but it, it very much depends on what kind of mom you had, what kind of, you know, what, what kind of mothering she was capable of, of, what kind of mother daughter relationship you had. So I'm reluctant to generalize because I don't want to marginalize the women who had really difficult relationships with their mom, you know, often because their mom had problems that she couldn't master on her own that got in the way of her mothering. Does that make sense? Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. And it's it's all so diverse. And yet I think you touched on losing a mother, especially through this arc of storytelling, is this ancient thing that happens that even we struggle to put words to sometimes. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot, there's not, there's very little language for a lot of what I, I find myself thinking about and writing about these days. You know, I feel like we're we're Maria Shriver, I think it was, who said we are a grief illiterate nation. And I've really thought about that because I think not only are we grief illiterate in terms of knowing how to you know, express it in ways that are widely acceptable and supported, but we don't even have good language for a lot of it. And so, I, you know, when I'm interviewing women or leading a retreat or, you know, engaging in discussions or facilitating conversations, I, you know, we're often sort of like just reaching for the right words to express what, what it is that we want to say. We find English to be limited in that way. Um, maybe it's no more limited than any other language, but there are words in other languages that I do find helpful. Like in Portuguese, there's a word, and I'm probably going to mangle its pronunciation. I think it's suadade. And it means um, the feeling of longing for something that you've lost while you are also grateful for having once had it. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, and I'm like, Oh my goodness, thank goodness for other cultures that have grief words that we do not. There's an outlet called Modern Loss that accumulates them and they've got words from Germany, they've got words from Spain, they've got words from South America, like all of these other different places that have and they they kind of cover one every um every couple months or so. And so there's a bunch of different articles and I can't off right recall one and then they also make up their own. So um the the phenomenon of suddenly gaining 15 pounds after somebody you love has died. They made up a word for that. And then there's something else that they call grief bacon. And I don't recall the definition, but I remember looking at that and being like, oh, I've experienced grief bacon as well. And so it's really funny to watch people make up words around loss. You're so great. I love that. Um, that. That sounds like pure Rebecca Sofer. I know her and I love her. And she, Oh, good. And she's been a guest here on Coming Back as well. She, oh, good. I love that woman. She's so funny and so smart. And um, yeah, I love, and I love what she and Gab Gabby are doing with Modern Loss. They're terrific. It's phenomenal. And just another resource for, for motherless daughters, but also I think there's tilts very much toward loss in your twenties and thirties, which is really important because much of grief support still is geared towards loss that happens after 50, after 60 mm -hmm because that's quote unquote, the natural order of things, but that's not how things actually happen. Honestly, it's also just demographically, you know, more, uh, I don't want to say popular, but it, it's just demographically more common, right? It's statistically more probable. So um, there's a larger need for bereavement services among that population in terms of sheer numbers, but it still um, overlooks this 
group that you know I've been really work that I've dedicated the last 25 years to, which are adults who were bereaved as children and teenagers who didn't get what they needed back then, oftentimes because nothing existed for them back then, except, you know, it was really, really compassionate um, and intuitive extended family, maybe, um, who could be be there for them. But I don't think, you know, it's, it's unrealistic to expect that our family members are going to be able to help us through these tough times when they're bereaved themselves. And, yeah. and um, so they're just, there's, but I, I will say, that children's grief services have come a long way since my mom died. You know, there was just nothing in my community. There wasn't even hospice yet for the dying, 1981, suburban New York. And when my dad died um, 23 years later, 24 years later, he died at home with hospice care. And it was really, really a beautiful, it sounds like an oxymoron, but it was a beautiful death. And he was surrounded by his family. He was making his own choices. He was, you know, he really went into it very consciously with his eyes open, uh, knowing what was happening and cared for very well until the very end. And it was a much better experience than what my mom had gotten. And granted, his children were adults now and not young kids. But I feel like end of life care is so important for the, not just for the dying person, but for the bereaved family members, because they're going to carry that memory forward with them, right? Of how their loved one died. Of course, this is not, this cannot be the case for someone who loses a loved one in an, an accident or by suicide or homicide, right? I'm talking, this is just for terminal illness. There's, there's no, uh, you know, there's no way I think to ameliorate the shock and the numbness and the suffering of those who lose someone very suddenly without any warning, you know, especially to a random act. But End of life care when someone is terminally ill makes a and good end of life care makes a really big difference in the people who are left behind. It can reduce their trauma significantly, and it gives them warmer memories to look back on when you know as they move forward. Because we are constantly. I like what you said earlier about having a relationship with grief, because I'm writing in this new book about something I really believe to be true, which is that the facts of a loss don't change, right? I mean, my mom is always going to have died of breast cancer in 1981 when I was 17 and she was 42. But my relationship to those facts have changed a lot over time. You know, they looked one way when I was 17 and they looked different when I became a mom and they looked different when I, you know, approached and turned 42, which is a huge transition for women in this group. It's a very big deal. And, um, and then they look different again. You know, I'm, I'm, I've lived a decade past my mom, more than a decade past my mom. And, you know, it, the facts of her death seem at the same time more distant and more preposterous at the same time that, that you know, that she could have died at 42 so is more surreal to me now than it was back then even because 42 is so young to me. And it, so I, I'm sorry, I, I meant to ask you on how, what your story, you were how, you were 21 when your mom died. Is that right? I was. And I think what drew me to your book a lot in the first place is that our stories were very similar and that my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, and then she actually, she kept us fairly well informed throughout the process. Um, but uh, she went into remission in January of 2013. And then in November of that same year, what doctors had thought was like pneumonia that wouldn't go away or just like a, a chronic cough turned out to be the cancer returned. And we essentially got about a week's notice that she was going to die. And so we brought in, we thought we were going to have a lot longer for what it's worth. We were told anywhere from six weeks to six months. Um, but then essentially once she found out she was dying, I think her body knew intuitively also. And this is something you touched on too. It's like, how could you not know that you're dying? And she was, she wasn't ready to go, but I think she was ready to, to stop trying to fight it off for our sake. Um, and it's not that we weren't important enough. She's like, um, it's so hard to put words to. Oh, I still struggle with this, but um, she wasn't ready to be done. But I think if it came between the choice between that or continue trying to fight off cancer or struggle against this, she she was like, I, I can't make that choice for myself anymore. Um, and uh, And yeah, she died in a week. And I kind of want to circle all of this back to your book and your story as well, because on close to the last page of your book, you talk about 
taking your kids and, and your husband on this trip to the Redwoods in California. And this is another thing that connects the two of us across space and time is that before she died, my mom was like, whenever, you know, whenever I go into remission, we're going to go to the Redwoods. And she kept talking about relentlessly about trees you could drive a car through. She's like, these trees are so big, you can drive a car through them. And she just could not fathom and could not believe that to be true. And we never got to go there. Like she never got to get there in life. There were a couple things that she wanted to do before she died. And that was one of them. And so the year after her death, we actually got a permit through um, the park service in California to scatter her remains in the Redwood forest. And we had this moment where we didn't get to see the trees you can drive a car through, but we got to go to this place called Remembrance Grove. And my sister and I were kind of trying to scout out the perfect tree. So we would know if we ever came back and we got about probably less than a mile up into the trail. It was an upward hike. And my sister taps on my shoulder and she's like, turn around. And we saw this tree. She's like, what do you see? And like clear as day, there was the silhouette of a woman's face in the side of this tree. It was like something out of Pocahontas, Mm -hmm. like grandmother Willow Mm -hmm. or something like that. And she and I both just got these full body chills. She's like, this is where she stays. Mm -hmm. And it was really, really cool to read your story in the end of motherless daughters of visiting the redwoods and finally being in this place where Mm -hmm. your mom had wanted to go and was so amazed by, because I was like, is my mom, her mom? Like I was just having this moment where it was so so connected. It's like, they died of the same thing. I'm also the oldest and she couldn't stop talking about the redwoods. Like, is this, are we having a moment here? Um, And, and I just wanted to touch on that before we, we got off the air today because that was one of the most connecting points in motherless daughters for me was that story of her, lingering even there in the trees years later. That's beautiful. That's really, really lovely. You know, I I grew up in New York. Who knew I was going to wind up living in California and passing Redwoods all the time. I back and forth to Northern California where my older daughter was in college. And, you know, we developed a real relationship with driving through Redwoods (laughs) over those four years. Um, And yeah, my mother was really taken by those, those particular trees, I'm not sure why, you know, she grew up in New York City, but there was something about them, you know, maybe their majesty or their enduring nature. And um, I found it really, I found it really compelling to spend time among them and feel close to her and bring my daughters there too. And both of my daughters are very avid backcountry hikers. They spend a lot of time in Redwood Forests and in the Sierras and Kings Canyon and um, I like to think that that's some kind of connection with my mom who, yeah, I don't know if she ever slept in a tent in her life, to be honest. Oh, she went to summer camp, I think. But, um, but they do ca- both carry her name. My older one is named uh, after my, my mother's first name. My younger one's named after my mother's middle name. And, and I, you know, I, I see pieces of her in them. I do, you know, every now and then, you know, a little, a little, uh, gesture or a tilt of the head or some kind of talent that they have that certainly didn't come from me, you know, that I think that, that I remember her having. And, and sometimes those 17 years I spent with her felt so brief. And sometimes they feel like, you know, they were enough. And I'm grateful to have had them because there's plenty of women who get less with their moms. And I've met a lot of them. And I know how hard that is. It goes back to holding those two truths. Mm-hmm. You can't can't drop either of them, and they're simultaneously true at the same time. I think this is a, a perfect spot to let people know where they can find Motherless Slaughters, as well as the rest of your books and any other work that you'd like to share with us today. Sure. Well, there's Motherless Daughters, Letters from Motherless Daughters, which is a terrific book for teenage girls. There's a lot of stories in there that were teenage girls wrote to me. Um, then there's Motherless Mothers. And all three of them are available online, and um, they're pretty easy to find. Uh, You can look for a motherless daughter support group or read more about me at hopeedelman.com. And if it's retreats or one-day workshops that you're interested in, I hold retreats about three, four times a year, and one-day workshops in different cities all around the U.S. The next one coming up is October 12th in Washington, D.C., and then there's going to be one, um, I think, November 10th in Los Angeles about getting through the holidays after a loved one has died. And that all that is at motherlessdaughtersretreats.com. Hope, I just want to thank you so much for spending time with me today. This has been a real privilege. 
Yes. Oh, and you know, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that next year I'm going to have a new book coming out that's called The After Grief, which is a term that uh, was created, that I created to talk about that period after those bereavement surfaces drop off. So it's basically starts at two years and extends for the rest of your life. And that hopefully is going to be out in the fall of 2020. Beautiful. Well, definitely keep me posted and I will launch it out to everyone that's listening today. I absolutely will. And thank you so much for this time and for this wonderful podcast and for, you know, keeping the conversation going and helping it to expand. So that's all for this episode of Coming Back. Thank you so incredibly much to Hope Edelman, whose book Motherless Daughters both captivated and educated me after the death of my mom. I am so honored to share space with you here today. Hope came back by seeing a therapist after her broken engagement, by writing Motherless Daughters in grad school, and by connecting with people who knew her mom in life. You can find all of Hope's books, plus her coaching and live retreats, on her website, hopeedelman.com. And of course, grief growers, you can find that link in the show notes. If you're looking for more grace, space, and room to breathe in the aftermath of loss, purchase a copy of my new book, Permission to Grieve, now on Amazon. To keep this little grief podcast going and to receive insider bonuses like weekly grief journaling prompts, podcast swag, and live grief support with me, pledge to support the show at patreon.com slash Shelby for Cynthia. If you liked what you heard today, subscribe to Coming Back on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and tell a friend about Coming Back, because you never know what someone you love is going through. Thank you so much to Addie Goldstein, who composed our theme music. You can find me on Facebook at Shelby for Scythia, Intuitive Grief Guide, Instagram at Shelby for Scythia, or simply shelbyforsythia.com. If you'd like to leave a question or comment for a future show, email me at shelby at shelbyforsythia.com. As always, my dear grief growers, it was beautiful sharing this space and time with you today. I see you. I'm proud of you and the work that you're doing in the world. And I love you. Because even through grief, we are growing.